however you are and whenever you are welcome good souls to paranormal now this is alan b smith join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs tonight joining me is david oates and we'll be talking about reverse speech his theory that when recorded speech is played backwards our deeper subconscious thoughts and motives uh, may be revealed while controversial david will share fascinating recorded evidence that he says supports his theory so i'm i'm really stoked to um hear some of his recordings i know david is on standby and ready to go before we go get to david a reminder that joining us tonight is also ryan sprague uh ryan will be joining us in the second hour um, at 9 p.m. EST, 7 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll be talking about the UAP task force report. And um, I think I'm going to drag Bill Skywatcher, our producer, <laughs> on air as well. Uh, so thanks, Bill. Plus, you, you and I really haven't had a chance to talk about this, Bill. Um, you, you popped into the live stream on Paranormal Pop Channel um, for a minute and helped hold that down while my computer crashed. So thank you for that. Um, and that goes to Charles and Amanda and Ron as well. So we'll have a chance tonight to talk more in depth. And um, if you want to jump into that conversation about the UAP task force, sound off, whether you hated it, liked it, um, constructive feedback, whatever it is, the KGRA DB hotline is 1-855-472-5483 or 85-KGRA live. Bill Skywatcher will pull you on. You'll be on standby, and then you can ask your questions or uh, share your feedback. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio, Twitter at Paranormal underscore now, and on Instagram at Paranormal Now. And as I mentioned, Paranormal Pop YouTube channel. Uh, I do have more Coffee and UFOs episodes uh, planned coming out, and then in the coming months... Um, some big changes in our life will allow me to make a uh, on-site series of videos that I will be able to upload to the Paranormal Pop channel that I think you'll really, really appreciate. So if you can go over there, subscribe, like, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for your support. All right, again, the KGRA line in the last hour is 85KGRA-LIVE or 855-472-5483. Three, David John Oates discovered reverse speech in 1987. Since then, he has dedicated his life to research and promoting it across the globe through lectures, training shows, and media appearances. He also uses it in his private therapy practice to help people break through their emotional challenges. You can find out about David at davidoates.com. David, welcome to Paranormal Now. Thank you very much for having me. Good to be here. Thank you. It, for, for me, it's been a really busy weekend with the UAP Task Force report. Um, oh, sure. Lots of coffee and not enough sleep. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's in that good, fun vein, right? Um, oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that gets me going. Um, what excites you? Is it, is it the reverse speech? Is that the mystery that, that drives you? Or what other oh. mysteries are... No, reverse speech is it. I'm uh, I'm 100% one-eyed reverse speech. It's all <laughs> I do it's my whole life. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, let's talk a little bit about the therapy aspect of it. I think that sure. that is very interesting. But before, just tell us, how did you get interested in reverse speech? And, and Oh, well, it started back in 84, actually. I was running a halfway house for street kids in Australia. I'm... I'm prior to reverse speech i'm a youth worker and uh, one of the kids gave me a cassette from a uh, an evangelist uh, claiming that rock and roll was the devil's music and if you played records backwards you could hear satanic messages so, uh, uh, david there's a, a a phone or something going off it's not on me no uh, interesting don't know, don't know where that's coming from um, maybe it's through the computer system itself but that's all right it's it stopped now so we can go ahead Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, um, so I uh, so I started looking at looking at backward messages in rock and roll, and um, I was finding the examples that the fundamentalists claimed were there, and I was uh, 
got a little bit intrigued. And in 1987, I started researching it full time mm -hmm. and accidentally stumbled across it in normal human speech. And uh, it's uh, one thing to look at rock and roll and find these satanic messages rather mm -hmm. amusing, but to suddenly hear it in normal human speech puts a whole different spin on it all together. Yeah, there's there's something um, fantastic about the reversing of music, right? Like when Paul is dead uh, right. from, from the Beatles, that's the first one I can recall hearing about. Right. Yeah, that was back in 1969. The mm -hmm. uh, There was hidden messages found on Beatles records that allegedly uh, gave clues that Paul McCartney had died. The Beatles always denied that they did that deliberately. Um, I don't know. The verse was seen quite clear to me. I, uh, Given the inventive mind of John Lennon, I... Uh, I think they probably did pull a bit of a marketing gimmick, but they've always denied it. Mm -hmm. But what that did was that got people around the world playing records backwards. They, yes, they started yes. to find the Beatles records, and uh, and then they started to find all these other messages that the Beatles hadn't put there. Or people said, well, we don't know how they're getting there. We have no idea. And then the mm -hmm. fundamentalists said, oh, it's the devil. It has to be the devil. Satan. Satan's doing it. So we got that big Satan in music controversy and uh, it's, yeah is that so a, is that a marketing tool in its of itself depending on the band to say that oh Satan yeah did it or, yeah oh yeah absolutely of course it is of course it is yeah it's a marketing ploy yeah look it's not very popular nowadays they used to it, it used to be fairly popular back in the 70s and 80s even into the 90s but mm -hmm. uh, i don't think bands are doing it anymore now not well, not potentially yeah, anyway yeah well i mean how do you really I mean, it's not as cool before we could we could run the tapes backward, we can spin uh, the record backward. Um, uh, and then when CDs came around, what, what what started doing, they were doing the secret song at the end of the album. So you'd have to oh, wait, wait like 10 minutes of silence and then a secret song. Um, but since you couldn't manually reverse something, then I think the, the cool factor was, was gone, you know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm not aware of anyone doing it for... Oh gee, ten, twenty years now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been, it's been, it's been a while. There's two different types that people seem to get confused. You've got intentional backward masking where the bands do it deliberately in the recording studio. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe the Beatles did. I mean, I believe they did it intentionally. That's my own personal belief. Sure. Then you've got the unintentional occurrence where the recording studio is not doing it and the band has no idea how the message is getting there and that's how the whole satanic message in rock and roll controversy started so so yeah oh, so where where do we how do we know how do you know when something is legitimate what you consider reverse speech and isn't oh well it's very simple there's no intentional soundtrack here, let me play a really simple example, okay? Sure. This, mm -hmm. this is Angelina Jolie, and uh, she's saying she grew up very aware of her own emotion. Now, l l listen, listen to the track, mm -hmm. and there's no superimposed soundtrack. I grew up kind of very, uh, very aware of my own emotion. Let me run it backwards. The little clip says backwards, I'm very aware. I'm very aware. I'm very aware. I'm very aware. And let me show you. I'll play it forwards. Here it is, forwards. I grew up kind of very, uh, very aware of my own emotions. And here it is backwards. Tom and I am very aware of uh, your own emotions. You hear how that just jumps up out of the gibberish there? Mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. it forwards. I grew up kind of very, uh, very aware of my own emotions. And backwards. Tom and I am very aware of uh, your own emotions. There it is. Uh, so, no, it's just soundtrack. so that yeah. sounds like, well, one way I would interpret that would be a validation of somebody who uh, is probably through some kind of trauma has learned to understand themselves and their own uh, oh. subconscious. And so it's almost like yeah, you're, you're, it's like a mirror yeah, effect. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We, we call that a, uh, we call that a, uh, that a congruent reversal. They're communicating the same thing backwards as they yeah, are forwards. Yeah. So, that, that, that's uh, really fascinating. David, I just have to ask you before we continue. Um, oh. Have you ever caught yourself, uh, you know, <laughs> sub subverting yourself? Oh, back in my early days, I used to do a lot of my reversals. Um, I don't do them anymore now. It's it mm -hmm. it it, uh, it it gets you too much into introspection, <laughs> right, right, which, right, which, yeah. 
which is good to a certain extent, but not, but not, but not always. So. Yeah, because it's good to know why we are the way we are, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you clearly use this in your in your therapy. Um, oh, yeah. Look, it's an amazing tool to look inside the mind and see what's going on and what we're really thinking and uh, what 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 we're really feeling. So, um, so here, let me let me uh, let me play you an incongruent reversal. Okay, this is the opposite. Okay, sure. So, so this is um, this is convicted murderer Scott Peterson being interviewed before his trial. Mm-hmm. The reporter says, "Did you murder your wife?" Did you murder your wife? No, no, I did not. So he denies it. No, no, I did not. No, no, I did not. The back, as he says, neck, I hit hard. Neck, I hit hard. Neck, I hit hard. So while he's denying it forwards, he's remembering how he did it, and he hit it hard on the back of the neck. So that's an incongruent reversal. He denies it forwards, but backwards he tells us, yes, I did it, and this is how I did it, if that makes sense. No, it it does make sense. But here's – what would be the mechanism for that? Uh, Because I certainly – it's the subconscious, so I'm not thinking about how I'm going to formulate a sentence. Uh, In your work, what what do you think allows this to happen in the mind? Well, it's purely by the ways that we create the sounds of our speech. Um, Like two people can say exactly the same sentence and you get completely different backward messages. So it's got nothing to do with the words themselves. Uh, uh, We believe it's coming from the right brain hemisphere. Um, The left brain is responsible for the words that we use. The right brain is the emotional intonation in our speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reverse speech is very much... um, 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 created by our the tonality of our speech or the amount of emotion we have in our speech. So um, uh, my theory is the left brain speaks forward, the right brain speaks in reverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the uh, split second before the brain puts the sounds of speech together, it's creating those sounds so that we're saying two things at once, one forwards and one backwards so it's an it's an automatic function uh it's another human sense um mm-hmm. i don't believe there's anything spiritual or woo woo or anything about it it's it's a previously undiscovered human sense by the human mind uh someone here in comment in section said just an audible palindrome uh, how, how do you respond to that oh or <laughs> uh, i can play many many examples where i'm not going to tell you what you hear and you're going to hear it um like for example um mm-hmm. yeah that's one of the that's one of the criticisms we're only hearing it because you're telling us what it says what i guess we're supposed that's... to hear sure yeah okay so let's play a couple examples without telling you so here's bob doll resigning from the senate in 1996 you do not lay claim to the office you hold it lays claim to you your obligation is to bring to it the gifts you can of labor and honesty, and then to depart with grace. Okay, so listen carefully. What's he saying backwards? I played at three speeds. It's an honor. It's an honor. It's an honor. What do you hear? It's an honor. Yeah, exactly right. It's an honor. That's a congruent reversal. He's saying the same thing backwards as he's saying forwards. Mm -hmm. Now, these phrases are occurring in speech about once every 15 or 20 seconds in uh, very clear grammatically correct sentences that can be heard very clearly by other people without being being said. Now, it is like another language. You need to get used to the accent. It's a skill you have to learn to find. But... The phrases are extremely clear, um, I, I think, for the most part. Um, here, let me play another one. Here, um, here is uh, here is a man. This is an example of of a man's spirit talking to him, oh. and he's talking to his tape recorder, and he's about he's worried about financial problems. Does it further for us to put more energy and money and <clears throat> effort? Okay, here it is backwards. You tell me what he's saying. You're right. Lean on me. You're What do you hear? I hear you're frightened. The second part, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, uh, no. yeah you're frightened. Lean on me. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're frightened. Lean on me. 
here at night. Right. Me and I'm me. And that's his spirit talking to him, saying, look, I know you're frightened. I know you're upset. Just lean on me. Trust in me. It kind of reminds it, me of EVPs. Uh, yeah, very similar sound to EVPs. Um, yeah. Um, uh, the difference between EVP, of course, to this is that you've got this contextual relationship of the forward and the reverse mm-hmm. dialogue. But sure, yeah, it's well, uh, it's uh, it's similar to EVP. Yeah. Well, I've wondered sometimes if electronic voice phenomena is our subconscious, you know, projecting an electromagnetic energy of some sort. And then that's being picked up. Um, so, so kind of like the same idea. It's almost like we're right. we're putting out there what we want to right. hear. Well, I actually believe that. <laughs> yeah, you oh. you just uh, you just hit on to my explanation for EVPs. Yes. Oh, I interesting. So you don't think EVPs are are ghosts or? No, no. I think we're creating them. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that we totally underestimate the power of the human mind. And uh, uh, the human mind has so many different senses that we have yet to explore. And uh, EVP, I believe, is, now that's just my own personal belief. I've done no research into EVP, so so please don't quote me. But that's just my own personal belief. I've got some quite stacking EVP examples on my computer, if it's, it's, which, which we won't get into today. But, yeah. Uh, well, do you actually do hunting uh, for for EVPs or no? No, no okay. not at all. No. When I'm doing tapes, when, when I'm analysing tapes for clients, I will occasionally hear EVPs. So uh, on, on the recordings. So uh, over the years, have, have you heard something that was uh, insightful in regard to the future? Uh, something that. Oh, in reverse speech? Yeah, oh, something that, sure. that revealed a sure. an event or a timeline um, before well, it happened. Well, let's play, uh, let's play a simple one that everyone will be fully aware of. This is George Bush, two weeks before America went into Iraq after 911. Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll help that nation to build a just government after decades of brutal dictatorship. The form and leadership of that government is for the Iraqi people to choose. And this one says, we will sit in Baghdad. So that's a future tense reversal. We have a whole lot of reversals that we call premonitions, uh, which look into the future. For example, here, here's, uh, here's one that'll uh, uh, take your breath away. This is 1961, JFK, in his inaugural address. The slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. And here he says, head is hit in the car. Head is hit in the car. Head is hit in the car. You hear that there? Head is hit in the car. I heard it, but if you keep telling me what I'm supposed to hear beforehand, oh, it kind of kind of undercuts okay. it. <laughs> but okay. yeah, next time right. don't okay. don't don't tell All us right. what so, uh, what what we're supposed to hear. Right. And everyone in the comments, if you're listening, feel free to type what you hear in YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, I'm curious if, if that'll line up with what it's supposed to be. Uh, okay. All right, here here's one here. This sure. is one I found before nine one one. Okay, not before nine one one, before COVID. You know, he was very much a control freak in that sense, and she felt very powerless and also very uh, suppressed, like I did. Right. Um, yeah, so you know, that's that. That's pretty much what I thought she would say. Then I spoke to my brother next. Okay, this is two two words. Here we go. I don't USA. Something. Southern USA. Southern USA. S U D D E N. Sudden. Okay. Southern. Here, I'll do it again. Southern USA. Southern USA. So I found that in September 2019. Mm-hmm. And based on that and other reverses I found, I said something sudden was going to happen to America mm-hmm. in the next three or four months. And it got COVID. Game. So do you think that that is a, a yep. psychic premonition or is that something that this person um, was picking up in, in language around him? 
Uh, well, I think both are true. Um, I think a lot of uh, psychic phenomenon can be explained by the existence of a common collective unconscious. Um, mm -hmm. With reverse speech, we're constantly communicating with each other on an unconscious level all the time. As I'm talking to you now, I am telling you in reverse what I'm what I'm thinking and feeling and what I'm planning for the day, you will receive that and get a general sense and gut feeling about what I'm saying. Now, you expand this out, reverse, of course, this gets into very deep reverse speech theory on the first radio show, but reverse speech taps into a common universal collective unconscious or a universal mind. Uh, it's like the internet. There's a communications link linking the whole planet together and then this collective unconscious we tap into knowledge and information um and so this person here yes was tapping into a common universal mind mm -hmm. which is created by this unconscious communications link that is transpiring all the time that's so we're, we're, we're deep we're... series so well okay yeah. but that's 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 where it gets complicated i think because uh we, we are all thinking like a million thoughts, right? Uh, right? At any given moment. So as I'm speaking to you, I could be genuinely sincere in what I'm saying to you, but that other part of my mind is thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch or, you know, so oh, how, yeah. do, how do we know when that interference um, is just mundane versus something right. to be taken seriously? Okay. Well, there's ways to tell. Um, um, I've developed, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, gee, well, where do I start? <laughs> I've developed uh, oodles of criteria for documenting reverse speech. For example, there's several different categories that reversals can fit into. They can be congruent, they can be incongruent, they can give extra information, they can give insights into the future. Most reversals will generally be related to what you're saying forwards. I would say probably 80 to 90% of them will have a direct contextual relationship. But yes, you can get reversals that will talk about what you're going to have for dinner or talk about what you're going to do after the show. Mm -hmm. They will appear, they can appear as well, but yeah. most of them will be related to the forwards. Okay, so how, how does one use this for personal um, right. okay. in, 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 in reflection, self reflection? How, how, do, yeah. how do they use this as yeah. a tool? Okay. okay, I have a very active therapeutic practice practice where I work with a client in the working through their issues. Reverse speech will A, tell us what the problem is. It will tell us uh, uh, many cases how to fix it. Um, for example, here is a client here who has money problems and she's talking about her money issues. So listen to this forwards. She and I need to work this issue out, but I, it started to bring up all my money fears and stuff. And the thing is, is I, if I know I start sourcing fear again, I'm gonna go yeah, no, way you down hell. Do okay, now here's this in reverse. You see if you can hear what she's saying. Look at my grief. Look at my grief. Look at my grief. What do you hear? I hear I grief. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Work on my grief. Oh, ah, do it again. Interesting. Okay. Work on my grief. Work on my grief. Work on my grief. So this is her unconscious telling me or mm -hmm. that in order to work with her issues, we've got to work on grief. And so, you know, using regular therapy, that could take me, I don't know, sessions to get to the to that uh, reason for her issues but reverse sweeps would go right to the cart and cause of what a person's problem and many times it will tell us exactly what we need to do to fix it so we're tapping into a common collective unconscious and um which 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 uh, which knows exactly what our problem is and in many cases exactly how to fix it so um well are so you're a therapist uh, yeah, I, well, yes, I'm a hypnotherapist. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been using this in therapy for thirty years now. So, uh, you know, I work over the phone and on the internet. I don't have any in-person clients. I do all my work over the phone. Oh, really? Over the oh, phone. So, okay. So you don't have, um, but you're not you're not like a practicing uh, uh, therapist with a practice. Oh yeah, yes, oh, yes, okay, yes. 
very busy practice. That's how I make my living. Yes, I'm. Yeah. You know, I currently have about twenty clients I'm working with right now, wow. and uh, I work over the phone. Yeah, over the phone and the internet. That's, so that's, how, that. how does it evolve with, with these clients? How you know, are there general stages that you notice when, when you first start working with them and doing reverse speech? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that varies from client to client. The, the, the first stage is acceptance. So first of all, accepting what the reverse will say about you. And mm. uh, that in itself can be a pretty daunting experience at times. Um, I'm coming, coming face to face with who you are and your own unconscious mind is a, uh, is a real eye opener. So, uh, so the first stage in working with clients is I record them for thirty minutes, and then I go and analyze the recording, and uh, come back with a transcript. It'll be transcript, you know, thirty, forty reversals, and uh, we'll go through reversals. We'll play them all, and uh, um, um, the client will have a pretty good idea what the source of the problem is mm -hmm. uh, I then do another recording where I ask the client how do we fix this what do we do to change change the problem and it's going to come back and tell me uh, using in metaphor um, then I take my client through a series of um, oh gee whiz the hypnosis journeys is the best way to describe it, it it's a unique Hip hypnosis journey hypnosis hypnotherapy mm -hmm. hypnosis Yes. Yeah, I, I'll place them in a light trance and I'll uh, work with their issues um, based on what the reversals tell me to do. So, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I get amazing results. So. We have a comment from Amanda. Poor guy, no one wants to hear the truth. <laughs> that's <laughs> that, about right. That's about right, right? That's about um, right. Even, even if we, we, we want to, we could, we could be in states of denial, right? Oh, sure. Um, absolutely. I work with it all the time. Yeah. So, okay. So what's the difference, right? So, you know, let's say as a therapist, you're just talking to someone and sure. you're trying to reflect back what you hear from them so that they can be self-aware and they might hear you, um, but they still put up a wall versus someone who hears the reverse speech and still puts up a wall. Is there yeah. a common denominator to help them break through or, or is it different in each case? Look, it's different in each case. Um, look, back when I first started my work many, many years ago, I used to have a lot of people put up walls and not want to accept the reversals. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really just been a matter of developing a bedside manner, you know, a good bedside manner and how to communicate the information. Um, uh, I don't find much problem nowadays with people accepting the message of the reversals. Um, uh, most people are fairly happy to hear them, but that's because I'm communicating them in a way that you know, look, look, back in my early days, I used to be very gung-ho. Now, this is what universal say. You've got to believe it. You know, you've got to accept mm -hmm. it. It's sort of like a sledgehammer approach, and that got me a lot of negative reactions. And uh, but I'm a lot gentler. I'm a lot gentler now. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's a real, uh, it's a real, um, um, it's a. It's a real personal, intimate journey. There's, you can't get much deeper than looking into your own spirit, yeah. and, and, and that's what we're looking at. Have Have you experienced any revelation in the work that there is a life beyond uh, the love? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, heavens, yes. Absolutely. Uh, I'd say reverse speech is the voice of the spirit. And it is the voice of the spirit. Reverse speech talks frequently about the soul, um, about about what lies beyond. Um, it's a very much a spiritual phenomenon. Um, and once again, this is something I don't talk about publicly very often. Gee, you're taking me to places I don't normally go. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it it talks a lot about it talks a lot about heaven. Uh, the the divine power that that lives inside of all of us um it's constantly the it it the voice of the spirit is constantly talking to us giving us giving us advice and guidance um so what have you heard i mean what what that would tell you hey there there is a heaven or there is this other world beyond um what we see and feel all right, I'm just pulling up my reversals to play you some examples. Sure, um, and I and I wonder maybe we can touch on this in a little bit. 
Um, if oh. you've if you've done other maybe religious leaders, um, oh, you know, yes, where, quite extensively. Yeah. Quite extensively. Yes. In point of fact, uh, I've just released my latest book, The Big Con, which is all about the virus, but I'm now writing my next book, which is all about uh, reversals in religion and religious leaders. And uh, um, so we'll be looking at looking at that. Okay, great. Uh, if you want to find out about those books, you can go to davidoates.com. Yeah, okay. All right, here, here. Here's one that talks about where is reverse speech coming from. This is me on a radio show. Mm -hmm. so, here, so here we go. Sometimes people ask me, does reverse speech endorse any particular religion? And the answer to that is no. There are no deities or religions that reverse speech endorses or says this is right or this is wrong. It, it just talks about the soul and the endlessness of life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that in itself is, is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay, now listen carefully. This is a long, this is a little bit harder to hear than normal, but tune your ears on, see if you can hear what this is saying. It's lilith in heaven. It's lilith in heaven. It's lilith in heaven. What do you hear there? It sounds like, is Lewis in heaven? <laughs> well, you got, you're getting there. Okay. <laughs> it, look, look, look let, let me just preface this by saying, mm hmm it's like learning to hear someone with a thick accent, okay? You're doing well. You're getting words here and there. So that's mm -hmm. good, okay? It actually says, it's the voice in heaven. Oh, so here we okay. go. It's the voice in heaven. It's the voice in heaven. Okay, you hear that? It's the voice in heaven. I should tell you, when I'm, training my, when I'm training my students, it's very common for us to be running a recording backwards in class and we'll all hear the same reversal at the same time. You know, we just jump out. It'll be very obvious. And So it sounds to me like the cadence is the trick. Yeah. There's there's, ah, a, there, there's a pausing and a cadence that you have to tune into. That's right. Exactly right. Yes, it's a cadence. Yes, it uh, is. So I take it you're a David Lynch fan. I don't know who David Lynch oh, is. Oh, really? Uh, Twin uh, Peaks? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Sure. With the back, the backwards speaking. Yeah, yeah, yes, I know all about that. It reminds yeah. me of that. Yeah, yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So look, look, it's an amazing technology. It's an incredible phenomenon, and um, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's not getting the justice it deserves. Unfortunately, it needs to be out there a lot more than what it is. So. All right. So, do you have a spiritual leader, um, of someone of note, that we can? Uh, oh, listen to. Sure, let me uh, go uh, to. Uh, I, I do wonder: is it possible that someone is a good person, um, but you reverse the speech, and you know they say something that sounds nefarious, or or vice versa? Uh, yes. Um, let me. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just going to go to my evangelist file and. Uh, uh, and a bill from KGRA said, okay, you know it's coming. Is it true about the reversal language in the song by Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven? <laughs> yes, it is true. Yes, yeah, there is, a, there is a, some um, nefarious methods on Stairway to Heaven. Um, I've got my <laughs> own interpretation as to what I think they mean. I don't think they're satanic. I think that's all, uh, it's all built into the uh, to the nature of the song. Mm -hmm. Um um so uh, uh i uh, yeah so that's my own take on it um i've written uh, quite a uh, quite a uh, long um description of stairway to heaven in one of my books so um all right okay here here's billy graham here's billy graham giving a, giving a prayer i'm going to ask that we all bow our heads in prayer okay what's he saying backwards how our boy how I abhor you. How, how I abhor you. Eh? How I abhor you. Yeah, how I bore you. Yeah. Oh, how, I was thinking yeah. abhor you. Okay. Abhor you. Yeah, same thing. How, maybe, how maybe. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So here, so here it is again for those who missed it. How I abhor you. Okay. How I abhor you. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to—I want to point out to you. No, notice all these verses I'm playing for you, and I'm not telling you what they're saying. Okay, you're hearing them. 
So, see, that really knocks the argument on the head that this is all projection. We're only hearing this because you're telling us to hear it, okay? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I have disproven that just time and time and time and time again. Well, what happens um, when you go to you know, other therapists or the scientific community? I mean, over the years, I'm sure you got pushback, right? Um, oh, yeah, a lot. So what's yeah. your presentation to them and what's your argument when they say, oh, this is this is just coincidence? Well, the coin okay, look, that's actually surprising enough. That's actually the biggest that's actually the biggest objection because because even even the skeptics say yes i can hear these examples i yeah, yeah i can hear them but it's just coincidence you play enough sections of speech backwards you you're gonna hear some sentences look my argument is very simple look these are occurring once every 10 or 15 seconds mm -hmm. they're occurring in grammatically correct sentences that majority of them relate directly to the forward speech there's this direct contextual relationship what a what a what are the odds of that occurring by pure coincidence? I mean, they'd be uh, incalculable. You well, know? that's the that's the intriguing aspect of it is that it relates directly to what is being said in the, in the regular speech. Right. Um, right. It, it's not you're not talking about, um, you know, I I I understand, you know, how much you love me, and then it says, "Let's make toast." Right. That's right. Look, and look, that was the first thing that convinced me that this was real. Um, uh, was this direct context with the forward dialogue? Here, let me play you the very first reversal I ever found in mm -hmm. human speech. Not in music, in sure. human speech. Let me just pull this up a little bit. And the contextuality of this just absolutely uh, blew me uh, blew me away. Um this is the one that got me uh, started on my uh, started on my journey. What I'll do is I'll just play you the backwards without playing the forwards. And oops, it's already open. Hang on, I've got so many files open here for you guys. Okay, here we go. Okay, see if you can hear anything in this backwards clip. Okay, here here we go. Can I have a Anything there? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I when I run this backwards, I'm running a tape backwards, and I hear two words: spacewalk. This is the very first reversal I heard in speech. Can I have a spacewalk? Can I have a spacewalk? Do you hear the spacewalk? I can, now? now that you say that, I can hear it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So then, okay. So that's what I heard first off. So I reverse the uh, clip and played it forwards. And this is what I heard forwards. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. So Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Yeah, yeah. And I read the whole so, clip. So does that debunk the conspiracy that it was filmed? <laughs> oh, I could get myself in a whole lot of trouble here. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, it does. Um, I've actually reached research the, the moon landing quite extensively mm -hmm. and I do believe that we went um, uh, I've got a lot of reversals to validate that we could do a whole program on that one that's going to lose me a whole bunch of friends uh, but but let me say the JFK assassination was a conspiracy so I go along with that well I think but, everybody uh, believes that to, they just don't know yeah. what the conspiracy actually is What what do you think it is Oh well, I, sure. I've researched the whole the whole JFK conspiracy. Um, Oswald was actually C CIA agent, and if you want to Google that, just Google CIA Lee Harvey Oswald, mm -hmm. and they actually the CIA put his star up on the wall of on it just four or five years ago. Why conspiracy theorists didn't jump all over that is absolutely beyond me. <laughs> and uh, he was hired by, he was being employed by the CIA to actually stop the assassination. The assassination was organized by uh, by uh, by uh, J. Edgar Hoover using mafia hitmen. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got the actual name of the assassin. I'm Actually, I can play the reversal. Um, sure. That'd be fascinating. Yeah. So, so he's... Pull up a, the really quick. Uh, so, Lee yeah, has the, well, is an aid is a CIA agent. So you're saying if we go online and Google that 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 what we're going to see that there was some plaque placed. 
you're going to see that there is a plaque placed on the, his star is placed on the wall of honor on the CIA. It, it, um, uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I've never heard I, this before. I'm surprised conspiracy theorists weren't all over this. I couldn't believe it when it was when it was plastered up there and no one jumped all over it. Um, yeah, Google CIA Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, you will see that his name has been placed up on the uh, CIA's wall of honor. So I'm just trying to find all my uh, all my JFK assassination reversals right now. Um, well, if anybody in chat wants to take the time to look that up, I'd be really interested in seeing that. Um, yeah, the, the links in my latest book. I I just don't have the link at the uh, at the uh, top of top of my head. But, is um, is was it a political motive? To assassinate oh, him. Oh yeah, yeah. It was to take JFK out of out of office. He was a real threat to the establishment. I mean, he was talking about doing all sorts of things that uh, that uh, they were very unhappy with him doing. Um, uh, oh, here we go. JFK assassination. Okay, so um, here's a guy who claims that he was the actual hitman who shot JFK. He claims he was the uh, uh, man behind the the uh, uh, gunman behind the grassy knoll. His name is James Files. Mm -hmm. He's a mafia hitman. Okay. And here he is talking to um, oh, Jim Mars. So. Uh, so here we go. Did you ever notice if uh, any of those rounds hit that sand? No. I, do, I don't know if anybody else has stood or not. As far as I know, their rounds never hit it. I know my round didn't hit it. Like I say, I fired one shot. I was on target. Okay, listen carefully. What's he saying back? Here we go. It ended my round. It ended my round. It ended my round. What do you hear? It ended my... I'm not sure. You had trouble with that one. Yep. Hit him with my round. Ah, it my round. It ended my round. You hear that? I hear that. It my round. Sure. Now you mm -hmm. listen to the forwards. Here's the forwards again. Did you ever notice if uh, any of those rounds hit that sand? No. I, do. I don't know if anybody else has stood or not. As far as I know, their rounds never hit it. I know my round didn't hit it. Like I say, I fired one shot. I was on target. So he's saying the same, usually round forward and round backwards. Now let me run the whole tape backwards. Listen to how it just jumps up out of the gibberish. Uh, you hear how it just jumps up out of the gibberish there? I'll play mm -hmm. it again. Sure. Uh, it ended my ramble now. It ever been my read. Look, I got thirty years of research into all of this stuff. I, I've looked at nine one one and JFK what? and RFK and Martin what? Luther King, and I've got them all. How um, do you know? How do you know when you're not projecting your own thought onto it, though? Ah, very good question. Yeah, uh, that is a problem. Yes, projection is a problem. It's um, it's a, a big problem I uh, I face when training my students. Um, um, how do I know I'm not doing that? Um, I think back in my early years, I used to do it a lot. I think uh, new students do it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, as time goes has gone on, I have learned to uh, differ to disassociate myself from the tape. Um, I'm um, really just a technician documenting what I hear. Um, we have a series of linguistic checkpoints that reversals must meet for them to be valid. Mm -hmm. For example, the syllable count must be correct, the constant vowel sound must be correct, the beginnings, endings, the words must be clear and precise. There's actually seven points we've developed to uh, to check a reversal. Okay. Um, um, I am the first one to admit that projection is a problem. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Um, and um, um, yeah, yeah we, that's all I'm saying. We found, thanks to Bill Skywatcher, the producer, he found this on Lee Oswald. Oh, you um, found it? Well, I'm not yeah. sure how legitimate it is, but I'll put the link in chat. But it yeah. says a memorandum, United States government, confidential, March 3rd, 1964. Uh, subject, Central Intelligence Report on the assassination of John Kennedy uh, to Mr. James Rowley, Chief U.S. Secret Service, from Mr. John McCain, 
Director CIA. This is different, but I'm going to read this. Um, In response to the request made by your office on 24 February 1964, re Lee Oswald's activities and assignments on behalf of this agency and Federal Bureau of Investigation, there follows a narrative summary of the internal... I can't see sur- surveillance. I think activities of the Oswald project. Now, I don't know how legitimate this is, but are you familiar with this? Yeah, yeah. Here's the link here. I've just found it. Hang. How do I add it to your chat room? Um, there. There we go. Okay, we'll share this with everybody listening. Okay. You see that link there? And yep. there's, there's mm-hmm. other links too. So, um, so, so, but I've actually got him um, admitting in reverse. He's worked for the CIA. Wait, I think I think you gave me the wrong link, David, because this one at the oh. top, at the top, it says note from du- from Duffel Blog. We are in no way, shape, or form a real news outlet. What? Everything on this website is satirical, and the content oh. of this website. Oh mm-hmm. well, that is that is the wrong link. <laughs> oh, um, unless just... unless you were unless you were duped, but I you uh, know. no no, there's an actual there's a real link. Uh, I, uh, I, oh, I've just gone bright red with embarrassment here. No, I didn't mean to. I was just reading that there. So, but this other um, memo that Bill had found, it, it is interesting. Um, it looks like possibly a FOIA document, but I, it's hard to tell. Uh, now, there's obviously was something suspicious, suspicious going on there. Uh, who, who directed this? Who, who do you think was behind all of this? What was the <sighs> Yeah, you know the the uh, buck the buck had to stop somewhere. Right. Yes, I know. Look, I've got lots of names involved in it. I've got George Bush. I've got um, I've got the George H W Bush. I've got the I've got the um, Knesset Israel's Knesset involved in it. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it seems a high level conspiracy between top people in the U S government and overseas mm-hmm. um, that uh, tasked. Jay Edgar Hoover was um, planning the whole thing. J. Edgar Hoover. J. J. Edgar Hoover. Here, let me pull one up. Here, let me. What would be. Pull up. Hang on. Hoover for you. Listen. Hoover, Hoover, Hoover. Where are we? Uh, Hoover, Hoover, Hoover. Okay, listen to this one. Here we go. And that the plastic that captured was down. Of course, the president had insisted upon that. So that he could stand up and wave to the crowd. This one's a bit difficult to hear. I'll play it. If you don't hear, I'm not surprised. What do you hear there? Can you play it again? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with this one. Yeah. yeah, and I thought you would. And I finance this evil. Ah, And then I've got Lee Harvey Oswald saying, uh, "Where are we? A B C D E F G H." I have to go and look for the actual link. It's in my latest book. I quoted the actual link. Um, so, uh, truthing the world got, uh, and I financed the killer. So that was close. Truthing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, where's the one I'm looking for? Where's Oswald? Oswald. 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 Uh, hmm. No, I can't. Ah, here we go. Listen to this one on Lee Harvey. Sure. These peasants uh, are uneducated. They uh, have uh, one of the lowest living standards in, in all of uh, the Western Hemisphere. Okay, this one's fairly clear. You should get this one. And you will tell them nowhere. You will tell them nowhere. Evil soul of Hoover, if you missed it. You will tell us nowhere. You will tell us nowhere. Anyway, well, that's the whole show. No, that, that, I, I, that one I was, I was getting. I got the evil right off the bat. Yeah, okay. um, so, right. But that's interesting. And that, it does seem to me that the the more recent the recording, the easier it is to yes. to decipher. Yeah. Yeah. The old the old the old recordings are pretty difficult. Um, I'm just trying to find the original link of the uh, memorial wall. Um, there's quite a few here. Um, oh, here's this looks like a legit one. Uh, <laughs> well, here's a legit <laughs> one for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's I exactly did. what we want. But um... I actually 
went bright red with an embarrassment when you, when you pointed that out to me. I know. Well, it's fun. Every once in a while, no one, a lot of people don't know what the onion is, right? Um, so once in a blue moon, people will see something on the onion and share it on Facebook and and um, and just not even realize that it, it is yeah. fake. Um, oh, I lost you, Dave. All right, Bill, looks like we lost uh, David. Let's see if we can get him to, to jump back in. That was that was odd. So here's my takeaway so far. It, it is intriguing. Um, I think that there is an argument to be made here. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that this is a foolproof methodology, but I do think that there is a legitimate aspect to this that one can can learn something about themselves by reversing speech but the question is is that because your subconscious literally is saying something or it's how you're interpreting um and helping yourself oh, hey david I'm, i don't know what happened i must have pressed the wrong way <laughs> you, you 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 ruffled some feathers <laughs> yeah, look, I hadn't planned to getting on the look. These programs, JFK and Moon Landing, I mean, their whole programs in and of themselves. I can't cover them with just one or two reversals, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sure. Uh, so, what about yourself? Tell us. Tell us. Was there one thing that you learned about yourself that you had to 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 push through, overcome, um, work through because because of what you discovered? Oh, lots of things, really. Um, uh, I look, I'll start off by talking about my speech stutter. I used to have a shocking speech stutter, very bad speech stutter. I couldn't speak. I literally could not put two words together in a sentence. And uh, and when I suddenly found myself with a public career doing reverse speech, I was in a real spot of bother. So uh, so I you know I did I did reversals on myself to find out why I was stuttering, and uh, I got some answers and I worked on it and fixed. it it up you know um uh, i went through a crisis of faith back in my uh, back in my very early days when i started d doing it um you know, i had certain fairly strong religious beliefs in the of a particular persuasion and uh, and uh, my reversals uh, came back and basically told me that i was wrong so <laughs> so so i went through a crisis of faith for many years before yeah. i uh, settled, settled down to what i believe now so, and what is it that you believe now? Oh, that the God resides within, that uh, we all have the power of the divine, uh -huh. that uh, we create and manifest the world in which we live uh, from the thoughts of the unconscious, that uh, we are creating now as we speak. There we go. That's what I believe now in a nutshell. Well, that's so, interesting, right? Because magic is spelling a spell is is putting yeah. words together and invoking something to occur do you believe in in magic like that yes i do yeah hmm. yes i do yeah 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 i i look i believe that there's a lot more to the universe than what we can see and feel and touch you know we're uh, we're just really just just scraping the edge of the surface r really um, yeah and uh and I mean that's that's the real thing I love about reverse. Speech. Look, look, people pe people like to find out the politicians are lying. They like to find out all the conspiracy theories, and I do that because that's what people ask. You know, that's what we want mm -hmm. the right days. But that's not what reverse speech is really all about. Reverse speech is really all about the power inside of us. The, 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 that we are divine, that we create, that we manifest, that God resides within, that the kingdom of heaven resides within, and. Yeah. Uh, that's what I find most exciting about reverse speech. All right. So if you can play us one last recording before we go, Dave. One last recording. Um, 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 oh, okay. Uh, quickly, off the top of my head, yeah. just... Um, 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 um. <laughs> oh, you've you've hit me. Hey, let me pull one up real quick. Yeah, okay, here we go. Listen to this one. This is me talking about where does reverse speech come from? coming to me and saying, David, I want to know what's going on inside my head, and I think, buddy, how are you asking me? All I do is play tape backwards, you know. Right. And, um, but I'm starting to get a few. And where I say, all I do is play taste backwards, mm -hmm. backwards I say, let's look at that, all I am inside. Let's look at that, you have to, all I am inside. Do it again. Let's look at that, you have to, all I am inside. There we go. Yeah, no, I hear, I hear, look, it sounds like look at that, then... 
then something, something, all I am yeah. inside. So, yeah, there's a little bit of gibberish. It's actually two statements. Let's right. look at that. Gibberish, all I am inside. You're absolutely quite right. Good ears. I'll play it again. It's just a little bit of gibberish. That's all. Okay. David, how can people find out uh, about your work? I go to reversespeech.com. Um, that's my website, reversespeech.com. And you can get my latest book, The Big Con. It's just been released uh, last week. It's all about the truth behind the uh, um, COVID, COVID and the coronavirus. So if all you right. want to find out what Reverse Speech has found out, then go and get my <laughs> latest, latest book. And thank you for having me. All right, David. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Good on you. You're most welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Have a good night, David. All right. That was, that was fantastic. We may have to have David back on uh, again in the future if if he is up for it. Uh, thank you all for being with us tonight. A special guest coming in the second hour is Ryan Sprague, who's jumped in to save the day. We will be talking about the UAP Task Force report, and uh, we'll see if Bill Skywatcher will, wants to jump in in the conversation. And uh, I'm putting some vibes out there. See if Race Hobbs can jump in as well. All right, this is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRADB.com. If you want to find out more about this show and other great KGRA shows, go to the website and join the members area. All right, I will see you on the flip side. Welcome back to Power Normal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your grateful host. Joining me in just a moment is Ryan Spreck. As a friendly reminder, the open lines will be open for the full hour for today's show. So if you'd like to call in, ask Ryan your questions, um, or just sound off about what you think the UAP report means and what the future looks like. I'm going to talk about this until I am blue in the face <laughs> because I do think that this is important. I think it's a, a turning point um, and there are a lot of other people that feel the same. So let's bring Ryan on who, uh, hey Ryan. Hey, what's up my man? How are you? Good, good, good. Thank, I want to thank you again for having me on your live stream uh, the other day. And a lot of us were live streaming and talking and excited about the <laughs> it UAP. was. Yeah. yeah, it was so, an emotional roller coaster to say the least. I'm sure we'll get to that. It, it, it was, yeah, yeah. And you had mentioned that on your live stream too. Um, you know, the the emotional impact all this has had because of the years of work that you've put into this. And, and so many other people feel, feel the same. For anyone who is not familiar with Ryan Sprague, he is the host of Somewhere in the Skies podcast, the author of two editions now of Somewhere in the Skies, the book. So you can go to Amazon and get that. And Ryan is a lifelong ufological fan. And now I, I dare say a ufologist. So Ryan, what's your Thank takeaway? You. What is your takeaway of the UAP task force report? Sure. And uh, first I want to apologize if you can hear my air conditioner, as Alan knows, it's pretty hot in New Do York it. city today. So <laughs> totally um, fine. Yeah. Yeah, earlier we had like a quinceanera going on outside, so it was pretty, oh. uh, pretty festive. Luckily, <laughs> they it's died down a little, but <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I like, yeah. Well, I thought you were meta being metaphorical, but it, when you opened the door, it felt like an oven, like just hits yeah. you, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been um, it's been an interesting weekend uh, for many reasons. So yeah, my uh, my initial thoughts on the report. Now, all day, you know, everyone was on Twitter just waiting. You know, it was like Christmas, like Christmas Eve. You're just waiting to peek at the presents, open sure. them up. And um, and no one was really sure if it was happening or not. Everyone pretended to know someone who knew someone who knew it was going to happen. And then, boom, 5 p.m. EST, I think, around then, it dropped. And immediately, mm -hmm. obviously, everyone 
just went through it. And I will tell you, my first initial scanning of it, I was less than impressed. Um, you know, it, it didn't have any photos, no videos, no specific cases to look at. Um, but there were some very telling things, which I'm sure we will we will get to in there. And I'll and I'll tell you this too. I've read it probably five times now, and every time I read it, I find something new that gives me hope that uh, this is just the beginning. It's called a preliminary assessment. So yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of where I am right now. It's been again an emotional roller coaster. I was upset, then I was let down, then I was happy, and now I'm super optimistic, man. I'm I'm excited. Mm-hmm. That that's great. I'm glad to hear that, and I agree. And that's why I I think it's okay that we're still talking about this because it's a, while it is a preliminary assessment, it's assessing 77 pages, I think, of confidential mm-hmm. uh, report that we don't get to see. So in a way, it, it it's tagging a lot of interesting things in very vague matter and language. So mm-hmm. you have to take the time to kind of reread it so that you can understand that there is something important uh, to that. Uh, so yeah. we're going to take a call. Actually, Ryan, we've got one already from oh, Bear sure. in, in Kentucky. Bear, welcome to Paranormal Now. Hi. Um, so I, I've i just been wondering why anybody is putting any stock in, in this report. I mean, it's a report from the government about activities on the government. I don't see any reason why they should be forthcoming with this. That, that is that is an extremely valid concern. Um, I'm actually glad Bear brought that up, Alan. Um, I can come on down on that if you want, if you want my sure, opinion. Sure, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bear, I, he's right. We have been burned by the government every time that it's come to governmental involvement with the UFO topic. Uh, mm-hmm. Robertson panel, Condon committee. These were all reasons to debunk the phenomenon and hope the public would move on from this. Project Blue Book even was a publicity stunt again just to get people to not this isn't a problem it's not a national security threat um Mm -hmm. why i'm personally excited about this bear would be because i see progress they didn't come out and say there's nothing to it it's not a threat because it could be it could be a potential threat um maybe not a direct immediate threat but it could be and they also were okay saying we don't know what it is i think out of 24 of the cases that they looked at, they were able to explain one. And the reason they could do that is because, or couldn't explain the rest, is because they uh, they lack literally the science and technology to properly analyze these things. Mm-hmm. So I see it as an opportunity to fund, hopefully, a permanent program, whether in the government or outside of the government, to look further into this thing. But I completely understand um, the hesitancy to immediately rush to what does the government have to say about this? Because we haven't trusted them for so long. So sure. it's a very valid concern. Yeah. Um, writing that tale, Ryan, I would add in the report, it says sociocultural stigmas and sensor limitations remain obstacles to collecting data on UAP. Although some technical challenges, such as how to appropriately filter out radar clutter to ensure safety of flight for military and civilian aircraft are longstanding in the aviation community, while others are unique to the UAP problem set. So narratives from aviators in the operational community and analysis from the military and IC describe disparagement associated with observing. They're afraid to report, right? Yeah, So exactly. The, and so what I would say, Bear, is that the language that I'm noticing that's a little bit different than Project Blue Book is, because again, this is an early assessment. So what they're, to mm-hmm. me, my, what I'm taking from this is that they're going to do more of what they're saying. Uh, they're going to expand on what they, the, the intents they have put out there. So the fact that they are openly saying we have a social cultural problem, we, we can't solve the UAP problem until we get people to start accepting it and not uh, knocking other people down or disparaging them. I think that is extraordinarily profound because we've already had more pilots, you know, as of late that can have supportive uh, radar data than we've had in, in quite a long time because of um, uh, ATIP and Lou Elizondo and TTSA. And now we might get that many more if we keep 
this zeitgeist going of it's okay. You know, no matter who you are, if you work for the government, the military, you can come out and talk about this. And in fact, we're asking you to please talk about this. So for me, now, maybe some people think this is ingenuine, and I, and I respect that completely. Um, but for me, it, it seems sincere. Um, Bear, do you have a response to that? Or do you have another question? Nope. Oh, okay, I think we lost the bear. I'm going to bring uh, Bill Skywatcher, our producer, on. Bill. Uh, you got to give me a second because I'm taking the phone calls, guys. He's multitasking. Oh, no. Yeah. Multitasking. Yep. What's He's going the on, Ryan? Right. Hey, what's up, Bill? How are you, brother? Good. Now, I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying. Okay. But when you look at this on its surface, mm -hmm. there's a couple of things that are laughable, in my opinion. Sure. Mm -hmm. When you say that historically that the Air Force has very little information regarding UAPs, well, that's a surprise to me. You're mm -hmm. telling me that they don't have very they have very little historical data on this. And then you say that they started a pilot program in November of 2020, a six month study on this mm -hmm. phenomenon. I mean, to the ordinary person that's not familiar with this subject, this is an eye opener. Mm -hmm. The stuff that you that is contained exactly. in exactly before, yeah. and another one was the other bin. What's in the other bin? I'd like to know what's in that other bin. The catch-all well, other bin. Yep. And the key word, and I've been saying this for months, guys, is the word investment. And Ryan, you hit it right on. It's about funding. Get, but the, but like you both said, there are avenues here for optimism, and that is. Congressional hearings, public hearings, because there's a lot going to be done behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. But they have to get the public aware that this could be potentially a threat, possibly from adversaries. It may be China. It may be Russia. But if I was a reporter, I would ask, well, is it UFOs? Do you have mm -hmm. evidence it's not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, I that way. Bill, that's such a good point, man. And I, you know, before all of this happened, I did. And um, let me know, Ellen, if you if you want to move on to other parts of the conversation. But when I when I originally heard about all this, I'm like, wow, what a brilliant way to fund Space Force. Like, here's a new military branch that's going to protect us from yep. outer space threats. Mm -hmm. And Bill, I still there's still a part of me that thinks that could be a possibility. However, the report wasn't even the big thing. Ellen and I talked about this on my live stream the other day. It was the DOD response yes. to all of this that really caught my attention and gave me hope. This 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 nine page report, it was whatever. It, it really mm -hmm. was. It all it showed me is the ineptitude and the lack of resources that this Pentagon task force had to look into this. Yes. Um, yeah. Again, one case. They were able to explain as a, a weather balloon. Of course, right, guys? Of course, it was a weather balloon. <laughs> Our worst enemy in the UFO field. But um, look, they want funding. They want to fund a new, hopefully permanent uh, DOD collection, data collection thing for UAP. And that's great. Look, if that, if that money is going to go to something like that, which could mm -hmm. potentially also help national security, I'd rather that than buying, you know, 50 more nuclear missiles or um you know stuff like that so i i even if this is a way to get money um i don't think it's for war i don't think it's to fight terrorism we have many of other ways we could get money for that in the government um instead of using this whole ufo thing in my personal opinion in well my i want to take two two things that both of you said so ryan you talked about ineptitude um, cause there, there hasn't been enough funding for this and there hasn't, and that's why in 2019, they set forth a new outline to study this phenomenon because there, there hasn't been a good, um, guideline for mm -hmm. reporting these for pilots. And that goes back to that sociocultural, uh, comment and because you didn't talk about it, like just turn up, you know, moving on Yeah, that report yeah. is not, I'm not, I'm not putting that report in. You know, you can tell yeah. your commanding officer, your commanding officer is not putting an official report in. Um, and so to, to your criticism, Bill, I wonder if the way that they're, they're phrasing this is meant that all those many years where we all know there were sightings by pilots and this and that may not be good enough data because 
these more modern era um, observations, you know, have eyewitness um, corroboration, uh, you know, visual visual sighting, uh, radar camera recordings that past cases just didn't have. And also, if you didn't have a proper protocol for reporting, then you don't have good data to work with. So mm-hmm. it sounds it sounds to me like they're they're kind of throwing all that out and going, this is happening every day. So we, we, they have enough cases to work with now with better okay. sensors and yeah. But it's in here it says the FAA captures data related to UAP during the normal course of managing air traffic operations. The mm-hmm. FAA generally ingests this data when pilots and other airspace users report unusual, unexpected events. Let's stop it right there. Even going back to close encounters at the beginning of the movie, uh, would you like to report a UFO? Uh, no. No. <laughs> yeah. Because they know. I just rewatched that, Billy. Yep. You know, it's yeah. like they know they're going to get sent for a psyche valve, ridiculed, possibly lose their jobs, their pensions. There's too much at risk. Same thing happens with police officers when they, they have sightings. I know a few. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys know a few uh, mm-hmm. pilots that you've interviewed or officers, and they say the same thing, like you just mentioned, Alan. I'm not going to make the report. There was a big case that Tyler Rogaway touched on that happened near Oregon where they scrambled um, fighters. Yep. This, they had a FOIA. Uh, they got all the, the, the audio data. They got the radar. So it's out there. It, yeah. It's definitely out there. But will they now become more open with revealing what they have? That's the, that's the question. Now, if Congress, you got to remember, with everything that's going on politically, do you honestly think that the agencies want to give anything to a civilian politician? Mm. Even classified, you know, like real information that it could be leaked out there. You know, I'm sure that there's uh, apprehensive feelings going on and thoughts within our government to put out information. I'm sure they're withholding a lot, even to the congressional hearing panel, whatever you want to put. You know what I mean? Well, yes. Oh, yeah. So there's there's two two ways. And Ryan, maybe uh, you agree or disagree. But I, I think there's the special access programs where you're just never going to see it. Right. Like it just it's in the private industry. You're not going to see it. But I think that like any FOIA request, if something is of national security um, and, and so we can't reveal technology, we can't reveal certain information because it could put the U.S. in jeopardy, then then the military uh, you know, can say we're re- redacting that. Right. Even even to, to Congress. Um, but there are people in Congress who have access to that information. And mm-hmm. so, I, you know, will they pass that on to the UAP task force? Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Cause the leaking is not an impossibility in my mind, because right now I, I truly believe that most military personnel um, grew up in an era where the idea that extraterrestrial life might be visiting earth is not so far fetched, and mm-hmm. I think we also have younger Congress people that feel the same way. I mean, I, I think collectively, I think there's an old guard that's been there, and and they're leaving one by one, and the new guard is much more open to the idea of sharing this information with the public. Ryan, what do you think? Absolutely, and the thing I kind of always turn people to is back when Blue Book was around in these very uh, filtered versions of UA, UAP investigation by the government. We didn't have the internet, you know. There weren't a million different ways that you could leak things out to the public or accidentally tweet something at three in the morning. That oops, that was classified. I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think you're right. I think the, the age we live in now, it's a lot harder con- to contain information. I mean, the only reason we have this Pentagon task force right now is reactionary it's because the new york times leaked that story uh those videos it's because christopher mellon and Luis elizondo came out and said guess what there's a lot going on that you guys don't know about you should Mm -hmm. know you have a right to know and they were backed into a corner so i think times have changed so much that even if they did want to do like a project blue book 2.0 it's Mm -hmm. not possible I honestly believe that. And look, even even in the report, it said they looked at the stuff that DARPA was doing, one of the most like yes. secretive yeah. companies out there working mm-hmm. with the U.S. military. Um, 
there was one group on there. I'm sure you guys know which one I'm talking about that wasn't included, and that was the Department yeah. of Energy, um, who are nev don't answer to anybody. <laughs> so I do have to wonder what they still got going on. But well, do you, I do, do think the age we live in now, we're going to get more information whether they like it or not. In the X Files, I want to believe movie. It was FEMA, um, but in this case, maybe it's, <laughs> right. it's maybe DARPA is the real, you know, shadow government. <laughs> yeah, in this case, yeah, putting alien blood in bees and stuff. Totally, mm -hmm. man. <laughs> yep. Are we have do we have Ron on the line? Yes, we do. But I'm just going to ask one more question to both sure. of you, mm -hmm. and then I'm off because I got to take the phone calls. Um, <laughs> what about the UFO community in in general? Because it seems like there is one side discussing one angle, disclosure, mm -hmm. and you have another one, psyops, false flag. This is Paul, all part of an agenda. You know what I mean? And there's, there seems to be two sides developing here in general, and I'm not going to mention names, but you gentlemen know exactly what I'm talking about. Where do you see this going with that? Because, you know, there's a lot going on from both sides. Me kind of to, me, to me, it makes sense that everybody finds some commonality because I think we're all truth seekers. We're trying to get to the truth. We're trying to get to the information that's been withheld for decades from the public, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go back and we can, talk, we can talk off different types of cases. I mean, going back to the nuclear bases being invaded or uh, flyovers, shutdowns, it goes on and on. So what do you guys think? And Ryan, great to see you. Uh, great you too, having you here with Alan. And we'll definitely connect soon. So guys, have a great show. I'm out. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can comment on that quickly if you want, Alan. Please. So for example, I've got them right here. I'm reading three books right now, all of which <laughs> have to do with exactly what Bill is talking about. There you these, go. All of these books have to do with government disinformation and using the UFO topic to uh, steer a narrative. So- the fact that I can come out of this UAP report after reading three books about government disinformation and still trust the government, um, I think that's kind of telling. So for me, I think um, there is a possibility that this all could be for some reason we will never truly know. There might be some really long game that the government is playing with this. Mm -hmm. What I think all of this is are, is a reaction to something they didn't see coming. And that was people working in a secret Pentagon program coming out and saying, I did this and they didn't take it seriously. And I think they should. So no matter what you think about Elizondo, a lot of people think he is a disinformation agent. Um, Look, man, he has put them in a corner and he's making them sound idiotic. I mean, you look at when he first came out, the Pentagon was walking back every statement they were making. And now I think they're finally in a place where they can't do that anymore. I honestly believe that. Right. It was, you know, like, were you investigating eight UAPs? No. Uh, were you investigating UAPs? Kind of. Kind um, of. <laughs> do you want to change? Do you want to change your stance on that? No, the original stance. What? Like, what are yeah. you talking about? Did, did yeah. Lou Elizondo work for this program? No. No. Well. Oh. Well, he had some assignments with the pro. Right. I mean, right. come yeah. on. Come on. That, that, that's Again, funny. Again, that's the thing with this report. Like, mm -hmm. they worded this thing. You know that every single word in this report was mulled over a million times. And yes. the fact that yeah. we still have things saying there's things we can't explain. We don't have the technology to properly mm -hmm. analyze this. Uh, that's telling to me. And it makes me think, yeah, some of it's probably Russian, China, black budget projects, but some of it isn't. And our senses are picking up, picking them up. These are physical objects. These aren't misidentifications. These aren't, right. um, you know, blip tracks on a radar. These are actual things out there. So, Okay, yeah. we're going to bring on Ron from Minnesota. You're on the air. Hey, Ron. Ron, you there? I think we lost Ron. Out. See if you can get him back on again, Bill. I'm going to hold the, the line open. Hold here. on. He's on the line. I, I don't know if he's paying. There he is. I'm here. There I'm he is. here. <laughs> hey, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, Alan and Ryan. Uh, good to hear you guys. Good to see you guys. And uh, great show, Alan. Again, you did it once again. Thanks. Um, your first guest and first hour was interesting. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, uh, hear me reverse speech, but I know you don't want to do that. But anyway, <laughs> um, we can experiment uh, someday. I had a question. 
I, I had a question for you, though. Uh, and thank you for Friday's show, too, by the way, Alan. Uh, that little extra uh, show that you did there, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was that was I totally un, unplanned. Thank you so much for, for jumping in. Yeah. That, that, that turned out to be epic yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad that you had that opportunity to have an open roundtable. That was fun. Uh, but anyway, uh, the question I have for all of you, mm-hmm. including Bill and anyone in chat, and I hold it in chat, um, I would like to know if this report has changed your opinion of UFOs. Hmm. I'm calling them UFOs. <laughs> I don't know, Ryan, has your opinion changed? Um, no, I, and I think that's good. Um, I, I haven't been swayed either way. Again, I'm, I agree with Bear earlier that I'm not just going to take the government's word on what these UAP are or what they think they are because we have been burned in the past. Mm-hmm. I applaud them for putting more of a focus on this and shedding the stigma and ridicule within the government for military to report these. After this report came out, Alan and Ron, I um, I had two military people reach out to me with their stories. So, and these are story, these are events that happened a long time ago. So they didn't have the luxury of reporting them because you didn't do that back then, but they are willing to come to civilian UFO researchers now to tell their stories. And we can now add that, you know, to the, to the data. And I think that's awesome. So I, I am still on, I err on the side that some UFOs could quite possibly be non-human technology. And that uh, report didn't sway me either way. Um, I just, I wish them luck with this program. I hope it happens. And um, yeah, we just got to keep looking for answers for ourselves, I think. Yeah. Uh, Number two, uh, question number two or question B, get aside or question one. Um, do you see another report coming to qualify what this report said? Yes, absolutely. I, I Again, this was a preliminary assessment. Even, you know, even the Pentagon was saying, uh, and Lou Elizondo too, that don't expect much with this thing. They've had little time to do this, no resources. I'm literally imagining like Mulder in the basement, like maybe one or two people Seriously. looking at these yeah. things, Ron. I honestly mm-hmm. think that. So I think this was a push to get funding. I, I'm not saying that's not true because they, they need it. And I think it's also just their first time really looking at it. These people, um, again, the people involved with Blue Book and the Air Force and these government, ATIP even, like that was a while ago. Um, this is brand new and i i applaud them for kind of starting from scratch um we saw some mirror statements from project blue book within this this report but um i think this is just the beginning again i think this department of defense story and memo that they put out about a permanent task force or a permanent program i should say um and also that reports need to be made within two weeks of the event um that's awesome again as quick as we can to investigate these yes. things, not waiting three years, you know, afraid of what people will think to report it. So I think this is just the beginning, Ron. I honestly do. Well, thank you for all your hard work you do. And thank you, Alan, for again, another great show. And I'm going to go ahead and let the other callers call in. All right. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate the call. Have thank a good you, night. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Bear. Great, great questions. We're going to bring on Charles Smar from Ohio. Charles, you're on the air. Hello, Alan. Hey, hey Ryan. Good to meet you. Okay. Here's- hey, hi, Charles. Nice to digitally meet you. <laughs> the big question to me is, is the UFO community going to get a seat at this table? It, is it going, going to? to- like every- always have been. I'm sorry, Charles. Can you repeat that? Is the UFO community, the people that have been doing this job for 40 years, mm-hmm. going to get a seat at the table? That is a great question. I'm so happy you asked that, Ellen. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I can come in if you want or if you want to hop in. No, go ahead. Please, go ahead. I'll uh, let you go. Okay. okay so, thanks. Charles, I think um, uh, Avi Lo, the, the the scientist, recently came forward and said, hey, Pentagon, you want scientists involved with this, you want the technology and you want the creative minds um, in the science community to help you, 
I'll lead this thing. So I thought that was awesome. And Avi Loeb is a person who has been shunned by a lot of the mainstream scientific community for his very controversial thoughts on Oumuamua and everything like that. But Mm -hmm. um, what I found interesting in this memo by the Department of Defense as well was that there is a possibility they're going to look at stuff outside of the military. So, you know, I I can't say, obviously, that they're going to come to me or Richard Dolan or, you know, any of these J. Allen Hynek types um, to come run this thing. But having a seat at the table, I, I, I don't know. All I know is there are over 50 different scientists that um, are part of the, the SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, mm-hmm. who have petitioned the Senate Intelligence Committee and said, we're willing to put our reputations on the line and uh, we want to help you guys. If you need help figuring these things out that the Pentagon's looking at, we're ready. And there were some very notable people on that report. I did an article for that over at Medium. Um, so I highly suggest people check that out, the names that are on there. It's mm-hmm. crazy. And they were able to explain, Alan, some of these things that the Pentagon says they can. So I, whether or not they're going to have a seat at the table, I don't know. But they sh- sure as hell deserve one, in my opinion. Including you. That includes you. Hey, that, and if, they, I think- if they want me there, man, I'll do it. Because, uh, you know, I've been running on this no job thing for about a year and a half now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I said this the other night and, and Charles, do you have another question before we let you go? Okay. So I, thanks Charles. I brought this up the other night. I think that this is going to float everybody's boat. Um, and anyone who has written a book, does a podcast, um, you know, works in a, you know, a, a, a community college, um, you know, and, and supports this theory and it sneaks it into their lessons in class. Everybody's going to get a boost from this, you know, um, because the the masses right now, it's, it's very much a niche subject. There's a mm-hmm. niche audience for these topics. That's going to explode, I think, particularly in the ufological, not so much the paranormal quite yet. Um, but that, that audience is going to. Not yet. Exp- and that are, we'll we that. already we will. We will. And we know the audience has already expanded because you have. Um, you know, uh, podcasts now popping up like from the New York Post, New York Times that are right. gearing towards covering this subject. And th- that's just going to keep growing. And just because those podcasts are are cropping up doesn't mean th- the other podcasts that already exist are going to lose listenership. Doesn't mean people aren't going to read Ryan Sprague's book because, you know, there are this many more Avi Loeb's writing books. Mm-hmm. I think everybody is, the enthusiasm is just going to fuel the interest. And I, I think it's a positive thing across the board. I have to agree 100%. I, um, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, no, so that's one part of it. And then the other part is talking to people who are in these communities and making that part of the research itself, of the study of the phenomena and the outreach to the public. That's what I'm afraid where there might be an oversight. My, my fear is that they're not going to reach out to, um, well, Jeremy Corbell is a good example, right? They, they, they interview him in the media, right? So he's already kind of doing that. But I don't know how many other people they're going to reach out to and say, mm-hmm. You know the actual people studying this not just the media and say what's your opinion you know what are your thoughts on this let's have a round table I, i'm not sure mm-hmm. I, I i don't think that I, i'm more inclined to think that that's not going to happen and that to me would be a sad thing i understand that completely um you know i talked to jim harold probably one of the you know pioneers in paranormal podcasting and mm-hmm. i asked him that very question i'm like what do you think you've been doing this for 15 years podcasting and you see new podcasts creeping up every single day about every topic you could possibly imagine. I said, where, where does that leave you? Like, are you worried about Spotify coming in, like just taking everything over? You know, it was Apple podcasts at one point. Now it's Spotify. Now it's, you know, iHeartRadio. like these big conglomerates kind of taking over the space. And he said, it is a valid concern, but you have to also remember that like, we are part of something um, that is still in its infancy. Podcasting is still in its infancy, if you really think about it. 
Look at how long radio is around. So I think everyone wins. I honestly do. And while you may see Jeremy Corbell on your television every single night on every single news station, um, mm -hmm. I think we have to give it time. I really do. Um, like you said, with the paranormal, you know, while everything is focused on UFOs right now in the mainstream media, um, it's because that was meant to happen. Pe certain people manufactured that hype to get it out there, to pressure the government. And that's where we are right now. We're living in the age of UFOs. But I think what we're going to see as this topic becomes more mainstream and accepted, uh, we start with the simple light in the sky. We move to craft. We move to beings. We move to abductions. And I think that's kind of the gradual road we'll take as humanity overall sure. again this report was probably mind-blowing to some people who've never really looked into it like you me or your listeners but um mm -hmm. i think we're on our way and i think it's going to take time and we have to have patience like disclosure is a process it is not you know the president coming out and saying aliens are here we've known about it mm -hmm. and um boom deal with it like it's going to be a very hard complex road and uh probably a lot weirder than any of us could ever imagine so yeah comment from blue sky in my opinion they threw us a bone that should keep us going for at least five to ten years <laughs> not trying to be debbie downer that is um, such a good point the, yeah. the ufo community will be talking about this report for years now man and that's of course, okay of course like that's fine we'll take what we can get from the government but like i said Keep doing your own research. Keep having shows yes. like this yes. where we talk to one another. Because if the mainstream isn't going to come to us, we have each other. And I think that's more important, in my opinion. I think that's where the true conversations actually happen. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, yes, that's true, that this is going to buy them some time, right, to, to look into it, but also to just not have to... <laughs> You know, address the issue with the public because they they're like oh we did uh, so we're gonna work we on some it. stuff we're gonna work on some stuff we'll check in with you we don't know when right um <laughs> that said the language in here was full of initiative uh it, it was full of the way we've been studying this is wrong uh or not wrong but inadequate mm -hmm. and we need to add more to our study and that's on top of all of the the tech that we have at hand already. Um, I know uh, Tim F. If you're listening, you hate it when I harp on Neil deGrasse Tyson, but because I love <laughs> I love Neil deGrasse Tyson, I, I I am a fan. But you know he he does a little debunker thing on occasion, and you know, he made this comment uh, during an interview recently about, well, as a scientist, you got to check all everything, right? You got to see the the radar instrument was there any kind of glitch was there something wrong with it well if he was keeping up with articles that, that were coming out this was addressed on a couple of occasions where they said it took like two weeks to run through the software mm -hmm. and to to verify whether the sensors of the lidar were working correctly and indeed i think this was the gimbal i'm not sure if it was gimbal or tic tac um but it was but he he never read that article and so it's going to take task forces like this to get it in front of his face right to, to, well, yeah, to man. pay and, attention and they have to be briefed like that's the problem with these scientists um and neil degrasse is a genius like there's no denying that but the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is he has absolutely no idea when the tic tac event happened who was involved what kind of cameras were used he doesn't know any of the specs or details of the case he just comes out and says could have been a glitch um, a pilot with 10 years of flight experience who's mm -hmm. um, working in the most sophisticated aircraft we have on the market um, doesn't know what they're looking at, can't uh, differentiate a bird or another plane for an anomalous object. So I think people like him who come out and make those statements, it's irresponsible and it's yeah. arrogant. Like, yes, you might know a lot about the universe and the possibilities of life coming here from, mm -hmm. you know, vast distances and light years. That's fine. I completely understand that. That doesn't explain the Tic Tac video. That doesn't explain what these pilots witness. Like, look at the data before you come out and say that. Or have the Pentagon come to these scientists and be like, this is what we have. Have at it. Like, mm -hmm. figure this out for us. Because we don't have time oh. to do this. We have more important things to do. Hi, Race. Sorry, All man. Right. I went we're, on we're the diet drive. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to welcome Race Hobbs. <laughs> onto the air we are honored race thank you how are you 
Thank you. I'm doing well. Thank All you right. for having me. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing good, my man. So good to see you. It's good to see you as well. <laughs> All right. So, Race, I don't know how much you've caught, but um, what's your takeaway? I don't know, man. I, I, I don't want to be a detractor. <laughs> I don't want to be an old fussy <laughs> man. You know me, Alan. You know what I mean? I know. Go like, for it, though. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. I, I, I can't say I'm let down because I expected it. Um, I can say that I was, look, I, I didn't, I wasn't going to admit this, but I was really holding out hope that they weren't going to play that same old song and dance. They weren't going to play that same crap, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I find it hard, um, you know, for, we don't have the right people i don't think um pressing the public buttons is what i that's the best way i know how to put it because gotcha. um yeah. uh i know that luis Alizondo has a good idea you know what i mean i know he knows what's going on mm -hmm. he knows the history of what's going on he knows currently what kind of cases we're dealing with and what's going on um we know they've had uh, top secret, you know, backdoor hearings for decades, for decades. One of my investigation mentors, uh, um, Bill Pitts, William Pitts, he was, he literally worked on Carter's scientific advisor team for, mm -hmm. you know, classified hearings and stuff back then. Um, we know that this is nothing new. We know they have tremendous video. Tremendous, is at least as far back as the 50s, at least as far back as the 50s. I was talking about this on our round table with uh, Lee Spiegel. And, and, you know, he interviewed Gordon Cooper many times. And Gordon Cooper, before he was ever an astronaut, went on the record, like mm -hmm. came out and said, you know, that a UFO literally landed on the dry lake bed right out here where we were testing arresting gear for you know aircraft carrier arresting cables and we were filming it with high speed cameras the best cameras we had at the time yeah and they literally filmed this thing raise up off the dry lake bed and fly away and he testified you know or he 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 talked about it on record i didn't mean, mm -hmm. testify you know before the united nations but literally talked about pulling the, the film up and looking at it, yeah. you know, and seeing the UFO on the film, put it back in the can, put the can in a pouch, gave it to a Colonel Courier and off he went. That was in the fifties. And so I have interviewed guys and I, you know, again, it's just testimony from them, former Navy uh, guys that we vetted that, uh, you know, were sub hunters. And they were flying around in, you know, Poseidons and, and they, he claimed they filmed them all the time yeah. um, because they seem to be interested in, again, you know, sort of like our nuclear technology and what we're doing with um, nuclear material. And um, so they're, you know, they constantly buzz our submarines. And um, so, you know, and, and then that our good friend, Mark, D'Antonio talks about being on one. The fast walker. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. I and love so, that story. I love it. And we all have a good friend who's, and I don't want to name her name, but her, you know, especially me and Ryan know her really, 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 really well. But her husband was a former commander. He spent like 27 years, I think, 25, 27 years in the Navy, and like 18 of it was underwater. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I've beat him with a club over the head, practically verbally <laughs> trying to get him to tell me something. Did it work? And he can't, he, he never would, you know, because of his, uh, his classification and everything. But we know that these things move under the water just incredibly fast. Yeah. And guys, I want to say, cause I walked in on the, on the Neil deGrasse. I love the guy too. He's a great spokesperson for astronomy. But he's no theoretical physicist. He's no mm -hmm. astrophysicist. He's he, he. These guys don't even have any business even talking about UFOs. Good point. That's that's like I said the other day. 
that's like Russell Brand talking about UFOs. <laughs> Anybody yeah. that would tune in to, to RB to listen to a story uh, or a show about the subject of UFOs is pissing in the wind. And yeah. so yeah. people that, um, you know, people that are serious about this, uh, you know, this was a big nothing burger for them. I mean, we're used to this kind of stuff when it comes to the government. But I've gotten calls all weekend from relatives and um, and old friends and you know guys like gals I went to school with and and even folks from church you know who are <clears throat> you know were the eye rollers before and now they feel like you know I've been validated or vindicated you know and uh, thank you and, I, I and, think and, race that's the most important thing to come out of this honestly. I think so. I think yeah. again, mm -hmm. like we might not have gotten what we wanted as in terms of UFO disclosure, but I think the Pentagon's right. It's shedding the stigma, not just in the military, but for us too. Like, like you said, so many people have reached out to me, relatives, friends, um, a middle school bully of mine who used to make fun of me for being into UFOs. And, you know, I draw UFOs on my, my term mm -hmm. papers and he'd take it and rip it up and whatever um the dude reached out to me after 20 yeah, something yeah. years and was like what is that going is on awesome. with this ufo That's stuff so cool <laughs> and he finally apologized to me so boom but nice. bringing That's people nice. back together that's what this topic does it's yeah, bipartisan yeah. it doesn't care what your religious beliefs are it doesn't care about your politics it doesn't care about any of that it transcends We're all of that and i think yeah it, yes exactly and i think that's what this topic is doing it's shutting what? the ridicule and it's bringing people together I think both of you kind of, uh, you know, broke this down for me in a better way that I can express this. So in the report, when I said before, it says, quote, sociocultural stigmas and sensor limitations remain obstacles. So the whole sociocultural stigma, um, the fact that they are recognizing here that their officers have been afraid to speak about it. Um, what this is doing is is signaling to the public don't be afraid to talk about it because we're saying that our military officers it's okay so if it's okay for them as a public person you know not following ufology i hear about this report i'm gonna go oh oh so maybe it's not maybe it's not that crazy yeah and uh, ryan I, you I, asked 100%. a really good ryan you asked a really good question on your stream i'd love to hear race's take on it and that is Race, do you think that this will open the door to the paranormal at large in any way? You know, my hope is, is that it kills the kook factor that they started. It was the government who started it to begin with. It was the government that ruined uh, commercial pilots' careers because they saw something in the air. It was the government that ruined military pilots' careers because they saw something in the air. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go back to the, the, the little kind of docu-movie, you know, UFOs, the story of Al Chop, you know, that, that was what really rocked me early on, was hearing him talk about these UFOs were there, we intercepted them with our aircraft, they left. When we left, they came back. When we came back, we kind of engaged them. And then they left again. So these are physical objects that can be tracked by our technology, yeah. detected and tracked. And you've got ground-based radar, air-based radar, air visual and these things are responding they're reacting to us back then back then not right. drones or birds or balloons or mm -hmm. you know of any of that and it was pilots it was good pilots that saw this kind of stuff even back then that um, were grounded for medical reasons or whatever and it got around word got around real quick if you see these things don't tell anybody because mm -hmm. you'll lose your career or you'll be in antarctica serving out your term or your tour or um you know just flat ass out lose your commercial pilot license um, well, let, 
your way of life will be changed. And it was them that implemented it. And I really hope that this is sort of them kind of weaving it into the conversation there. I think the what you want, I'm just going to say it. I really think this is their way of trying to get it into the conversation. Meanwhile, um, those that have the information Mm -hmm. are doing what they've got to do and no more than that Mm -hmm. to get their fingers on the budgets they need for what they need to do. But they have so much more. And I really think that it, it may be we can't handle what they know. And I don't think that I'm, I'm not, don't think for one second, I'm saying they've got all the answers because I'm not saying that, yeah. but I am saying they know a hell of a lot more. And I think that if they could correct the kook factor that they implemented back after world war two, yep. that if they could end that, and like Ryan was saying, like you were saying, you know, that people will feel more comfortable to come forward of a professional nature and a more higher level of credibility for the rest of us all to be able to be a lot more comfortable in believing, then I think that that would be a win for the direction we're going or okay. they're going. We're going to bring uh, Bobby. You are on Paranormal Now live with Race Hobbs and Ryan Sprague. Welcome. Yes. Um, so um, about the Neil DeGrasse Tyson, I know him. From the from he he remade that Carl Sagan Cosmo series, mm-hmm. so um, so that's the only I know about Neil deGrasse Tyson. Except for he's more like one of those astronomical what you call it. Um, so um, my question is, with the with the documents that that you have received and the testimonies you, you have received, do you think do you think it can open up? To the paranormal community about UFO and UAPs, as as mentioned. I'll I'll touch on that if you want, Ellen. Sure, go ahead, Ryan. So, for those who don't know, the prior Pentagon program that looked into UFOs, ATIP, uh, was strictly UAP, UFO related, but it was an offshoot of another program that was also funded by the Pentagon, uh, which was called OSAP which actually had a lot to do with Skinwalker Ranch. Um, I'm sure people know the television show on the History Channel. Um, This crazy ranch where paranormal things have been sighted, uh, portals, werewolves, uh, shadow people, ghosts, UFOs, everything you could think of has happened at this like paranormal amusement park, basically. And uh, the government looked into it. So look, if this is where we're at now in terms of the government looking at UFOs, and they have in the past looked at much stranger things. Look at what the government's put money into. Remote yeah. viewing, um, you know, telekinesis, all these weird things that we consider mm-hmm. paranormal, they have looked into because they want to try to use it to their advantage. So if they can find a beneficial way of harnessing the paranormal, you know, you know they're gonna they're gonna do it. So yes, mm-hmm. I, I do think that this is a very small step in the overall uh, paranormal UFO conversation. I, I yeah. really do. I think we're starting with UFOs, which are the most scientifically, I think, obtainable thing, anomalies, possible alien life. This could happen. Um, and then we ask, can there be a disembodied spirit? Can there be a, a uh, missing link of a cryptozoological creature? Sort of stuff like that. So yeah, I do think it's going to open the doors. That door might open and close very slowly, but um, I think we'll get there. I do. Bobby, thanks so much for the call. Yes, great show. Excellent producing and guests. And uh, you have a good night. All right. Have a good night, Bobby. Take care. Uh, Race, what's your take? The paranormal is a broad brush. Mm. There's Man, there's a lot to it, man. There is a lot to it. But um, I want to kind of walk back to something that I was thinking about earlier when Brian, you know, he just, he, every time I listen to him talk, he stuff fires off in my mind. But I started thinking about, um, you know, when he's talking about ATIP and, and, and these programs, this stuff is so compartmentalized. There are groups within groups, lifer, lifer careers, not 
elected careers, but positions that these guys have for 30 years, some maybe 40, that they have this technology in their hands and no one else knows they have it. Yeah. You know, maybe that film that I was talking about with Gordon Cooper went to some, you know, NRO group that, mm -hmm. you know, has stowed it away and no one, you know, maybe four or three people know it even exists. That there, there may be people that don't even know it exists anymore. It may have been shelved in, in some safe behind a safe behind a safe and mm -hmm. no one even knows where it is anymore. Well, that, um, Brace, that leads me to a question on the same topic. Is it possible the UAP task force could go down the mm -hmm. rabbit hole and just, you know, look into things like OSAP, you know, um, and, and these other, like Ryan was saying, you know, programs where there's been contracting um, for paranormal investigation, exotic materials, um, NIDs, you know, there's... If they go down that road, will the public even find out about it? Will they include that in the reports? Well, you know, I guess because Bigelow went to bed with the government, he can't say anything about it, about anything he learned, about whatever he learned. Yep. It was interesting, though, that when he got the contracts for those pods for these ships that are going to go to, to Mars, he, he could have cared less about UFOs anymore. Because I think early on, his mission was to try to figure out this technology to get people to his hotels in orbit. $15 yeah. million dollars a pop for the Russians to take his clients up there? That wasn't going to be any kind of business model he could thrive in or anyone <laughs> after him. You know, so, you know, so many people are trying so many different ways to get us out there cheaper. Yeah. And I think that was a big part of his mission. But when he got that contract, all of a sudden it was really funny how he just, you know, but he had the means to, uh, and, and the mind and the mm -hmm. team to approach the government, to approach his, his, uh, political leaders and, 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 get the job yeah. Done. Yeah. 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 and get the job done. And he got the money, you know, and, uh, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I remember I was in uh, MUFON when that happened, man. I was I was right there. And, uh, and it, you know, there's a lot of data there. And that's the thing that I wanted to go back to is the reason that science has such a problem diving into this subject is mm -hmm. because science is a slave to repetition. Right. They can, the scientific method cannot be applied unless they can control it and they can re repeat it yes. and get results that that you know they can do something with. But they do address and that in the report. They do. They yeah. did. They did. They did. Yeah, surprisingly. And, and, yeah. You know. And, uh, yes. Um, but you know, there's John Alexander who said for years there's no big giant department in the government that's dealing with this subject. Yeah. And I wanted to slap him for saying you know because it sounded like. He was saying, you know, it's, they're not, they don't care. And, uh, you know, I knew better and we all knew better. And, and, uh, but that wasn't what he was saying. But, but that's and what, that that's was what Bill just was. my five years into UFOs back in, you know, 1995 or so, 96. Yeah. Well, that goes back and to I Bill's, real to new. Bill's, that goes back to yeah. Bill's point, Race, that there's all this evidence over the decades that the report doesn't even comment on and like you were saying there's a video and who knows what out there um that are they pretending that it doesn't exist or are they just hyper focused on modern day evidence but guys this is the end of the show i have to, to wrap it up race thank you so much for jumping in it's always a pleasure ryan thank you again for starting at eight and then switching to nine <laughs> and i really hey, appreciate man. it anytime <laughs> i love coming here thank you Okay, well, have a good night to you both. Thank you. You too, brother. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you both. And if you want to find out more about Ryan Sprague's work, go to Somewhere in the Skies um, on Amazon. You can purchase his book there or check out the podcast. And, of course, Race Hobbs is everything kgra so just go to kgra and you'll find him. Um, you know, I want to quickly bring Race on real quick. Race, where, where can we um, – where can people get your roundtable? Yeah, it's on the the main website at kjradb.com. Okay. Um, it's right there on the front page. You can't miss it. 
Okay, perfect. All right, so go yeah. check that out. Uh, really fascinating. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I want to thank my producer, uh, Bill Skywatcher, and from KGRA, Eric Brager and Race Hobbs. Until next time, everyone, live in the mystery. 